the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's August the 2nd, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Kanesport.com. Joined this morning solo by our managing editor, Matt Shodell, as we discuss the news of the day. And uh, Matt, the news of the day is a continuation of the news of yesterday. Um, fall practice began and uh, we were out there at Green Tree and uh, it was quite interesting. I thought uh, the first thing that we discovered was that an unknown school has flagged Miami for an analyst participating in practice. And because of that, the media is not allowed to take photos or videos of any practice field activity after the early stretch. So we apologize to you guys uh, that until or unless that policy changes, that we are not going to be able to provide you the usual uh, depth of visual coverage of practice. So you're going to have to rely on Matt's eyes and my eyes, and we will do the best that we can to give you insight on what's going on. But first, Matt, I want to just vent. And for one morning, I'm going to direct my anger away from you, and that's going to make your legion of fans happy. That is going to make critics of my anger for you um, happy that I come in peace to Matt Shodell this morning. And my rage is directed at whoever decided, well, first of all, let's go to the NCAA, which has a ridiculous rule that analysts in the program can't participate in the coaching of players, okay? And that's just absolutely ridiculous. Every analyst in the country participates in the coaching of players. And the fact that the media is trying to do its job and take pictures and film video of practice, and somebody says, oh, geez, look at that analyst talking to a player. He's not allowed to do that and sends it to the NCAA. I mean, that is absurd, okay? And, you know, we're all for intense knockdown drag out competition in college football that is over the top okay because i guarantee you matt the school that did that has its own analysts participating in practice in different ways and um as every other school in the country so that's number one uh you know and then number two would be the school that actually decided to send whatever media footage they found to the ncaa to say hey look Miami's analysts are coaching. So let's start with your thoughts on analyst gate. I mean, has it occurred to you uh, at any point that they made this up to annoy you <laughs> and, and to prevent the media from constantly taping these practices? Because listen, uh, I'm a conspiracy theorist. You know, <laughs> uh, If you're a conspiracy theorist, and, and I think at least half the country is by this point, why not? They made it up. I mean, look, back in the day, you know, you heard stories about Miami coaches would catch an LSU coach handing a bag of uh, a, a bag of money to a player, like in a high school hallway. Like, that actually happened. But they didn't report it because then they get reported on. You know, everybody was cheating. Everybody's analysts are, are, everybody's analysts are helping coach, of course. Uh, but, um, but look, I mean, uh, the, 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 to me, the most surreal moment <coughs> of the whole day and you know, they sort of, they come out and they tell you, hey, you can't film anything other than guys touching their toes, which, you know, why even have us film that? I don't understand that either. Uh, but look, it was, it was nice them to let us see at least 40, 45 minutes of practice. I'm not going to complain about that the way modern day football is, even though we used to watch the whole practice. But the most surreal moment is, so we watched the first five periods of practice and eh, maybe there's 15 or 20 of us out there. And at one point, um, you know, we're told you can't film anything anymore. Fine. Nobody filmed anything. Everyone followed the rules. And then in period five, they start to usher you out of the indoor practice facility because that's where they started practice today. I assume they didn't want players to overheat on day one. Uh, you know, you were too slow getting out. So, so, you know, Matt Shodell, the intrepid reporter, fakes injury, and I'm like staggering out as slowly as possible, looking behind me just to see, you know, because that's really when the periods begin where they actually do some, even though it was in, in, in shorts, uh, they, they actually have some contact. They're lining up ones versus ones. I just enjoy watching it. Like, I'm not filming it. I'm just watching it. You know, I'm just looking. And I'm looking behind me. And, 
you know, it, it was uh, right on the side where the where the exit is, where the media is exiting, like literally right there. Maybe they were they were lined up ten yards from me, twenty yards from me, you know. Uh, and and the Miami Sports Information guy sees me looking backwards as I'm slowly backpedaling out the door to be one of the last people out the door, and he yells, "Shodell!" So I'm going to go ahead and say that every coach probably um, now thinks that Shodell is a play they're going to be running this year. And the players were like very confused. Like what's, what, what play is Shodell? Because they're literally in the middle of lining up for a play when they just hear Shodell yelled across the IPF. I thought perhaps it could have been handled differently. Perhaps he could have quietly said to me once we were outside, Shodell leave faster. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't look if they're worried about this, you know, disrupting practice by actually just watching some things. Uh, you know, a guy who uses reading glasses and can barely see anything and fans say he's super annoying and, like, nerdy or whatever. Like, you know, I, I don't understand why Shodell was yelled across the entire IPF during uh, actual practice rep. But that's what happened today. That was the surreal moment. The surreal moment was not them making up an excuse to not let us film uh, because they've made up the stuff before. That's why I say that it's a conspiracy theory. They've made up stuff before. Uh, you got to film tight because so and so is complaining, or this and that, or you know, blah 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 blah. But it always just seems to be rules for certain people, and other people post everything perfectly wide, and they never hear a complaint. There are certain <laughs> people that they just seem to to be ultra concerned about, and those are generally the people who sort of know what their job is and what they're doing. And I think the reason they're concerned about it is because the people who know what they're doing and have covered the team for a long time also can see the warts. There are warts on this team. There are warts in this coaching staff. There are warts that need to be fixed. Um, you know, I don't know what fixes warts. Uh, I don't think you actually get them from frogs, but maybe avoid frogs for a while. You're, you know? you're already seeing warts in the coaching staff, huh? Well, I talked to you about it yesterday. I don't want to call anybody out. But look, we, we, we did get a chance to talk one-on-one with some coaches. Obviously, it's media day, and there were some things that, that – they said to me that we're a little concerning, you know, where it seemed like they didn't quite understand the level at which these guys have to be or, or, or now, you're, should be. now you're getting ready to kill all the media access. No, <laughs> we're I mean, gonna, we're gonna have zero access by the time you're done that show down. But I'd come in peace today. I'm not going to get all rattled up. Or there are, there are some really good things going on and there's some things that need to be fixed. It's okay to say it. It's okay to say that coaches who are, Maybe, you know, I'm not going to say it was both coordinators, but both coordinators coached at a different level, right? This is a different level now, and they need to be prepared for it, of course. Um, so it's going to be – it's a transition for them as much as it is for new players, you know. And, uh, and you know, you like – just, you know, you, you have 30 days until the first game. You know, you have 30 days, 31 days, whatever it is. You, you, you need to be on point from the very first, first rep, the very first practice. Um, and you know, just the part we saw yesterday, it's very hard to tell whether they were good or bad. Like you can't tell, but I can tell you what they were practicing for 45 minutes. Wasn't like something that was, you know, they weren't really doing anything schematically any different than what we saw in the spring. It looked identical to the spring to me. And I would have liked to see maybe they were progressed to different types of drills or different things, you know, uh, than what they did in the spring. But I guess maybe the first week is just going to be rehashing some of the stuff from the spring. I, I get it. That doesn't bother me that much. But at some point, I do want to see when I'm watching those 45 minutes to an hour of practice, I want to see something different than the stuff we saw in the spring. Because in the spring, I wasn't overly impressed. Like, they looked okay. They, they looked better. To me, they're better than last year. Uh, but I think some of the opponents might be better than last year also, which is the problem. And they have to be significantly better and significantly more consistent. Um, so I, I've been talking for way too long. People are going to be annoyed. But, like, you know, that's just my philosophy on it. Not me, man. I'm not annoyed. I am all about Matt Shodell today. You can talk all you want. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that. Listen, I, I will tell people that some of the things that I've seen, remind, I'm a big Monty Python guy. I've been watching the whole Netflix. Uh, they have a great Netflix documentary on Monty Python. And it's like it's like the flying circus sometimes out there. You know, like it's just what what's happening. You know, if they all talk with British accents and dressed up like women um, and like, you know, shouted, you know, they're going to fart in our general direction. Like, none of that would surprise me with some of the stuff I see out there sometimes because it just seems off the wall. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure I'm sure there's a method to the madness. I know Mario is on point with what he wants. I'm just not sure that his entire, um, you know, the method to the madness that he wants is quite in place yet. And it, it does take time. He has a whole new coach. It really is a whole new coaching staff. They've had 15 practices before today. I mean, 
there's a lot that had to go in. Shannon Dawson was literally hired right before the spring. So there's still a lot that has to be done. Uh, I do think the personnel is better. I'm not sure yet how much these guys are are on, you know, are, are sort of in the scheme, understanding the scheme. You know, the safeties, for instance, are going to be running everything, you know, not the linebackers. Like Cam Kinchins is going to be calling out the defense, which is actually, I think, fine um, because he's probably, you know, he is a coach on the field. So it actually, in this particular team, it makes a lot of sense. But um, but there's it's, it's, it's a lot different. Than last year, and you know Shannon Dawson coaching from the you know he's going to be coaching down on the field. I, personally, I'm not a fan of that. His explanation was, I just want to look in guys' eyes. I just want to see their demeanor. Like, you know, listen, maybe that works at Houston, but like this is an X's and O's chess game, and a lot of times you can't see what you need to see as a coordinator from the field when you have that big view from upstairs. And now you're lying. He says he's going to rely on somebody else. He won't tell us who. He's going to rely on somebody else as his eyes upstairs. You know, I don't, I don't love that. Um, you know, I, but so, so some things like that. My guess is by the midway point, if I have to make a prediction, like last year I predicted Mark Fletcher would flip. Everyone's like, I'm crazy. This year, my prediction is by the halfway point of the season, Shannon Dawson will be upstairs in the box. <laughs> okay, that's my big prediction for this year. I think he's going to realize eh, I, I don't need to be on the field so much during games. All right, let's um, let's talk a little bit about what we saw since we are uh, going to be the eyes for all the fans here that. Uh, follow Kane Sport and our show in the mornings. And um, a couple of things uh, jumped out at me a little bit. I, I mean, I thought the quarterbacks that are on the roster um, looked looked okay. Tyler, incredibly sharp. Uh, Jakari, I think, looks better than he's looked in the past. I'm not sure he's, you know, ready to be a, um, you know, a, a passing game wizard, but but he's uh, he's continuing to make progress. Uh, the question is how how fast can that continue? Um, I thought Emory Williams he had a few uh, tough throws early, but uh, he looks very very good to me, and uh, I think he's the real deal and, and is going to be a factor in this program um, long term. Uh, so, but the thing that stood out to me is that's it, man. That's all they have. They have three quarterbacks, and it's really hard to run a great practice with three quarterbacks and. Um, you know, they, they, they've got walk-ons doing the rest and the throws are very erratic, you know, they're walk-ons and, and, uh, they're not going to be as good as scholarship guys. And I think that that's a little disruptive to the reps that guys are taking when they happen to draw the walk-on quarterbacks, you know, the the throws aren't always going to be on point. They're not going to always be accurate. Uh, and I think it's disruptive to, uh, offensive practice. So. We've already heard moving forward that Miami, uh, they already have Judd Anderson committed. You know, we know we know that. But uh, I hear that they are exploring and recruiting other quarterbacks. Like they are continuing to recruit several quarterbacks because after this season, they are going to have to make an assessment of where they are at that position. Uh, you know, what's Tyler going to do? Where's Ja'Curry stand in his competition with Emory going into spring practice? Do they go in the transfer portal and bring somebody in? Um, where does Judd Anderson fit into all this? He's going to be a true freshman. Um, the quarterback is short. I mean, the, the program is short on quarterbacks. Okay, so we're going to see a lot of activity, I think, later on this year in recruiting of quarterbacks. I think they will add at least one more high school quarterback to this class. Uh, and I believe there's a great chance they also will add a transfer portal quarterback to the class. So that's, that's one thing that really jumped out at me. Uh, I like the way the, uh, the receivers, you know, look to me like they've made an improvement. Uh, I think that's a a good sign. Uh, Really didn't get to watch the offensive line very much today. Um, You know, really, you know, didn't really get to see much from the running backs today, to to, to be honest. A couple of the DBs, Jumped out, uh, Jadeus Richard in particular. He had a really nice interception early in practice. And and uh, he's the guy that played a lot of football at Vanderbilt. And it shows immediately on day one on the practice field. I love that pickup. I think he's going to help them a lot as probably a safety. Although they're cross-training all these guys. They can play corner or safety. Um, I'm guessing his main role will be as a safety because they are going to be dropping uh, James Williams down into the box quite a bit. Uh, Matt reported on that 
uh, very well yesterday, and that's not a surprise at all. This is a third straight. You know, get, I get jumped on if I say I think James Williams should be a linebacker, okay? And and I have no doubt about that. He should be an outside linebacker. Uh, as Whether he'd be great at it or not is debatable, but I don't see him as a pure safety. This is the third straight defensive coordinator now that has decided that that's how James Williams needs to be used as a guy that moves around but spends a lot of time near the line of scrimmage. He is not a good open field tackler. Uh, and Lance Gidry has already figured that out. And you're going to see James Williams near the line of scrimmage a lot this season. So those were some of the things that, you know, jumped out at me uh, real quick. Uh, you know, it, it was day one. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of different things. Uh, Matt, talk a little bit about what jumped out at you. Well, I, I look more <clears throat> on day one, like Jadeus Richard getting an interception, whatever. They're in shorts. It means nothing to me. People could be like, oh, my gosh, you know, Jadeus Richard's the real deal. He got an interception. Like, whatever, man. No. Uh, what, what I look at is personnel usage because it sort of tells you what coaches are thinking, where their weak areas are, and, and things like that. So, to me, I think one of the most interesting things was it appeared to me like Corey Couch was playing boundary corner with Jaden Davis, the nickel, uh, which I was surprised by because Takori's not the fastest quarterback, but he is twitchy and he's, the size is an issue for him. I mean, he's fast enough and, and the size, you know, he doesn't have the size, but it just shows you there's some desperation there, you know, because uh, I don't think they're thrilled with Daryl Porter Jr. I think Devante, Takori, and Jaden Davis, they see as their best three. And I think for some reason, they don't love the fact that Jaden Davis uh, at Oklahoma was given up tons of chunk plays uh, as a boundary corner. And, and, and I think they like him more um, at nickel. You know, I think he has good blitz capability, has his decent strength and size to hold up, and, and he's good enough in small space, I think. So so that was interesting to me. Uh, but it just shows you they're very concerned at corner. They're trying to find answers. Uh, the offensive line uh, was the exact same first team, which is fine. I, I was hoping Samson Okanola would – at least be getting some of the first team reps for the 45 minutes to an hour we watched. Uh, it didn't appear he was. So, uh, you know, I, I don't love Jalen Rivers, honestly, at left tackle. Like, that's just not for me. I, I watched the spring game. I, I did watch him in some practices. I wasn't, like, paying attention only to him. But, like, he he doesn't seem like he has those long arms, the bend, the quickness to really deal with some of these outstanding defensive ends Miami's going to face this year. And I was hoping Samson maybe, you know, he looks NFL ready. You know, I was hoping, you know, I, I think Samson athletically, they'll tell you, is better than Jalen. But it's, what's, it's what he has to learn. He played at a much lower level of high school than a Francis Maui Go, and, and that's tough to overcome in a matter of months. So I didn't love that. Uh, I also didn't love that, you know, Francis Maui Go dominated one rep. And then a few reps later, just he got torched, got torched in just one of these individual drills where a guy just bent right around him, faked inside, bent right around to the outside, and, and he just wasn't paying attention, wasn't quick enough, whatever, barely even touched the guy on the way to the to the fake quarterback because this was just individual drills, and that's all we can see right now because they're not really doing 11-on-11 11 11 stuff. We saw one, you know, pseudo 7-on-7. Seven seven. But, uh, so, you know, these are the little, just the little things I look for um, because it, when they're in shorts to declare somebody is going to have a great camp because, you know, he threaded a ball uh, between two defenders to to Tyler Harrell, which, which Jakari did, or because Jadeus Richard guessed on an out pass, which everybody knew Tyler was going to throw and just decided he was going to break extra early and intercepted it when, you know, because he knew the receiver was going to fake and then go upfield because that's what this drill is, right? So, I mean. Last time we saw a Miami defensive back make a play like that was when Trey John Bandy did it against Notre Dame. Okay, but he, here's yeah. what I'm trying to say. He didn't what play. He, he, I don't know if coaches would tell you this. To me, that wasn't sound defense because what that whole drill was about is prevent, you know, make them take the check down and then come up and make the play, right? Two-yard gain, three-yard gain. What he did instead was say, if you want to do a double move on me, I'm going to give up the 80-yard touchdown, but I'm going to try to get an interception. And he did the same damn thing the play before where he just broke before he should have and broke up that pass. Oh, I mean, man, you're going to I mean, that's what happened. Bad. That's what happened. The results are great. The results are great. Don't get me wrong. It's like, it's like when, it, it, you know, I'm a baseball guy. It's like you swing at two pitches in the dirt and the pitcher screws up and grooves it right down the middle and you just get lucky and hit a home run. I mean, you know, if, I, if I'm, honestly, the offensive coordinator, if I'm, if I'm Shannon Dawson and I come out there tomorrow, I'm whispering to that outside receiver, listen, he's going to fake the pass to you and then go deep. 
if Jadeus Richards on him. I guarantee you, Jadeus Richards will be sprinting full speed up as that receiver is running right past him for an 80 yard touchdown because I watched the play. Jadeus broke before the ball was even thrown, which is okay if it works out, which it did, but it's not really what they teach these guys to do, which is why you don't see interception after interception of Tyler Van Dyke on these little rinky dink passing plays, these little things that they do before practice. So, you know, before, before 11 on 11, sorry. Uh, it wasn't seven on seven um, either, by the way. These were just, you know, routine passing drills with, you know, with the sort of on one half of a seven on seven and another half of a seven on seven with a different quarterback. So, you know, I don't want to um, make it something it isn't. I just don't, I don't know if Jadeus Richard was amazing and like, He's the greatest defensive back ever at Miami because he broke up a pass and then intercepted a pass in basic drills. Uh, but I have a feeling that really wasn't what they wanted him to do. I just have a strange feeling about that one. Uh, one thing you you, you know you, you talked about was uh, where guys are lining up, and I I think early in training camp they're taking a look at everybody everywhere. I, I don't I I, oh, yeah. I I I'm not putting too much into where guys are lining up right now. They're cross training. At a lot of positions, they're they're preparing themselves in case there's injuries during the season. They're getting a full read on where all their players are right now, especially here the first week of training camp. Uh, so I don't think I think in a lot of cases we don't know exactly where guys are going to be playing a lot. Um, you know, something else I wanted to mention that I think I like is I like where they're going with third down pass rush. Um, it's looking like Mesador and Ruben Bain are going to be inside rushers in passing situations. They'll have Nigel E. Kelly and one other uh, player on the outside uh, rushing the passer. And um, I, I love that utilization, utilization of personnel. Uh, I think that's moving in the right direction. And then it lets guys like, you know, like as usual, a guy like Leonard Taylor go to the sideline and um, get, get, a, get a rest so that he's not, you know, winded out there on first downs. Uh, when they need him making plays. So, um, you know, good things that you know, we're seeing in, in spots. Uh, you know, obviously there's still areas of the team that, you know, need need work. You know, defensive tackle, I think, is still a concern uh, in, in general. Uh, you know, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, we're going to be watching the linebackers uh, as we keep getting deeper and deeper into fall camp. Um, obviously the cornerbacks. But, but um, I think all in all, Matt, if we were to sum it up, a really you know productive first day uh of practice at green tree and uh we will be back out there uh this morning in, in, in giving you guys a lot more coverage on the website today um for those that missed it a whole boatload of stories on the website uh for you guys to check out if you have not already um receiver ray ray joseph we got a story on him he caught four thousand balls a week over the summer 4,000 balls, Matt. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, how do you catch 4,000 balls off a jugs machine in a week? How many How many hours was he working at that? Well, you know how it is. It's it's like when um, when somebody walks in your door and you're doing push-ups, you're, you're going one, two. If someone walks in the door, you go 800, 801, 802. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but I asked, I asked him, I, I said to Ray Ray, uh, this is, you know, we did some one-on-ones obviously at, at media day. I said, I said, are, are you counting? I mean, I said, because I wouldn't want to count to 4,000. I said, that's a great I, question. I said, way. who's, I said, who's keeping track? You know, I don't want to say, I think somebody's cheating and making up numbers. That's not a nice thing to say. So I said, who's keeping track of these numbers, uh, Ray Ray? He said, oh, the interns, they make the interns be out there all day long, all night long. You want to go catch the duck machine? They call an intern, get out to the IPF. And that intern literally logs how many balls you catch every, every single session. And so there's an intern out there that hates Ray Ray Joseph so much right now. I mean, they really hate Ray Ray, whoever the, that intern was. No doubt about it. Because he was out there nonstop. Like, this intern had no life. That's a little bit different. Or she had to watch and count all the Ray Ray catches for an entire <laughs> Two months or whatever, whatever the offseason's been since the spring. It's a little bit different for an intern than uh, getting Mario some uh, Cuban coffee in the morning. You know, uh, uh, that's a tough assignment, man. Counting balls being caught off the jugs. Anyway, um, some other stuff we have stories on uh, linebacker Wesley Besaint um, and his new role in uh, Lance Gidry's defense, and um, that's a really interesting story as well because uh, Wesley Besaint is a linebacker who's a little bit under the gun. Let's be honest. Uh, they need him to show development, Matt. And, uh, 
you know, there were some some warts, as you like to call them, last year. Like, he did not always know what he was doing out there. Now, another defensive coordinator comes in. He's got to learn a whole new defense. Uh, but he seemed to indicate that he feels he is doing well in that regard. Yeah, I mean, look, I just tell it how I personally see it. I think I'm not concerned about Wesley Bassaint at all. I think this defense is so much better for him and for guys like Jared Harrison Hunt, by the way, also, than the Kevin Steele defense. The whole Kevin Steele defense was predicated on having these big, you know, defensive tackles, you know, uh, and, and then and the defensive linemen in general holding up their guys and the linebackers coming in and making plays behind them. Um, it wasn't an aggressive, you know, attacking. You wouldn't call that an attacking style defense. And, and the reason that he, Kevin Steele can do a great job as a coordinator is he's a, he's a sound defense coordinator. He is a technician as a defense coordinator. He understand, He's seen everything. That's why he's at Alabama. But the Miami personnel he had, some of it didn't really fit what he wanted. When you're in an Alabama program where you've got depth upon depth, you can pick and choose the guys that you think fit what you want to do as a defensive coordinator. And you have a sound defensive scheme. That works great. Uh, I think Lance Guidry's defense in particular is really, really good for this team, notwithstanding if there's bad cornerback play. Because if there's bad cornerback play, it all goes out the window. But notwithstanding that, uh, this is not a team with big defensive tackles. You know, This is not a team with uh, amazing run-stopping linebackers who can shoot in gaps and make plays. This is not a team that has a James Williams that's ever shown he wants to make tackles. He wants to run down the field and make big interceptions and return for touchdowns. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat undersized team, even though they've gotten bigger. And when you're a little bit undersized, but you have athleticism and you're quick, you want a Lance Gidry style defense. You know, you want an attacking uh, up tempo. We're we're blitzing, you know, from everywhere. Uh, this guy's going to go here when you don't realize he's going to be there, and he's going to get in a passing lane and make an interception. Like that's what you want. So for this particular for this particular team, like if it was a championship level team, like what Miami had in the day, I'd rather have Kevin Steele all day long over Lance Gidry. I'm sorry, Kevin Steele's experienced. He's sound. Lance Gidry takes chances. Lance Gidry. He could hit home runs against really, really good offenses. And he, he and Manny Diaz court. were in class together. What's that? He and Manny Diaz were in class together. Oh, well, okay. Great. Thanks for that. He uh, really but, but anyway, so getting back to, to Wesley Bassaints. Wesley Bassaints last year, his job was to, to tackle, right? And he had 30 tackles. He started the last three games. He didn't have a single tackle for loss. He didn't have a single forced fumble. He didn't have a single interception. This year, he's going to be blitzing. He's going to be covering something he did in high school. Guess what? He he, he was at cornerback in the state championship game two years ago. He can cover, believe it or not, okay? Um, so he's going to be doing a lot more of what fits his skill set in terms of him being able to utilize his talent as a difference maker. Because, you know, you make a tackle after a five-yard gain or a 10-yard gain, all right, whatever. But when you make a game-changing play, when you blitz and get a sack, fumble, strip, fumble, recover for a touchdown, you know, those are game-changing plays those are the kinds of plays I think a guy like Wesley Bissant can make when he's put in a system that allows him to try to do that. And I, I really think that this Lance Gidry defense, as much as it gambles, as much as it takes chances, there are guys on this team that will benefit from it. I don't think the cornerbacks will, but I think Wesley Bissant will. I think Jared Harrison Hunt has a chance to start and will because I'm not sold on Branson Dean. Uh, and, and I think Leonard Taylor... I think Nigel e. Kelly, these are guys who are going to do really, really, really well in this scheme. And you, and you made a great point with the defensive tackles. You know, when we were talking about that, when I was talking about looking at personnel, I agree 100% on that. You know, you put those guys inside in passing situations and you have, you know, if it's game on the line, you got Nigel e. Kelly or Jafari Harvey, you got Akeem Mesador and, and Leonard Taylor or um, Ruben Bain on the inside or off the edge. I mean, you've got four or five guys that are elite to me, pass rushing guys. And when you know that they're not going to, be able to run the ball for a first down on third and eight plus, I mean, there's going to be, this team's going to get a lot of sacks. This team's going to get a lot of sacks. This team has several players who are going to have 10 plus tackles for loss. I think that the Saints, even with none last year, will be one of them. I think Leonard Taylor will be one of them. I think Akeem Mesador will be one of them. I think James Williams has a chance to be one of them because he's going to be all over the field. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more tackles for loss, sacks, interceptions. But I also think there are going to be a lot more explosive plays than what Kevin Steele's defense gave up last year. It's just it's just the nature of it's plays. the nature of what they're doing. Uh, you know, it's it's a feast or famine. Uh, you know, I mean, like there's I read a story, an amazing story yesterday about uh, this Japanese guy who paid fourteen thousand dollars to get a a dog suit that looks like an actual collie, like it looks like a dog, and he acts like a dog and he's living his dream. You know, like you can dress something up as whatever you want it to look like, but at the end of the day. 
when you're attacking and you're attacking, you're attacking, you're giving something up on the back end. You can't, this is why not every defense coordinator out there runs what Lance Guidry does, you know, even Manny Diaz, like his defense at Penn State, people think it's gonna be great because he has the personnel on the back end to hold up. Like if you believe that to Corey Couch and Devontae Brown and Jaden Davis are three of the best cornerbacks in the ACC, then this Lance Guidry defense probably will hold up just fine. But if you have any concerns about those three guys, then what I previously said is true. They're going to have a lot of game-changing sacks and interceptions and things like that, but they're also going to give up a lot of long touchdown plays uh, through the air and potentially runs up the middle because of defensive tackle issues. Uh, like those are my two concern areas just heading into the season, just, just to be uh, you know honest with everybody. All right. Another story that's on the website today is I did a, a really cool interview with uh, Jay Allen, and it was nice to get to know him a little bit. He's the transfer from Nebraska, the running back. And uh, I was blown away by his mindset going into fall camp. This is not a guy that came to Miami to just share reps with Henry Parrish and Mark Fletcher and be part of the rotation. This is a guy that envisions himself as the dude at Miami. Like he wants to be, you know, Willis McGahee, Clinton Portis. He, he's not looking to just be another guy in the running backs room. And um, I love it. I, I, you know, I don't know that that's how it's going to play out, but I love his mindset. And I think you'll love getting to know Jay Allen. There's a nice video that goes with the story. Um, make sure you uh, check that one out on the website. Today. By, by the way, you know, what was weird to me uh, when I talked to AJ was, you know, I've talked to a lot of running backs in my time. He had a, you know, he looked a little different than the average running back. You know how linebackers, they got the thick necks. Like they're a little bigger in their upper body than their lower body. Usually running backs have a bigger lower body than upper body. He had one of the bigger upper bodies I've seen on a running back, uh, which is why he can be a power back, even though he's not the, you know, the heaviest guy. Uh, but he, you know, he's strong, man. Like I wouldn't rule anything out with him. And, and kudos to him for saying, I'm leaving Nebraska. Uh, where he had a really good freshman year last year before he got hurt. And coming to a place where there's a returning starter, you got one of the top incoming freshman running backs in the country and Mark Fletcher. You got Don Chaney come back off injury, who honestly is very similar skill set wide, skill set wise to AJ. Um, you know, and, and AJ is trying to make a, a, a niche for himself uh, by catching the ball. He, I think he said he was catching, you know, fourteen hundred balls off the jugs in the summer when when Ray Ray was doing four thousand. But it's a running back, right? Running backs aren't supposed to catch fourteen hundred balls either. So he's trying to find a, a role for himself in this offense. And the good news for him is Shannon Dawson said it's going to be running backs by committee approach. Uh, you know, which which was interesting to me, too, because Shannon Dawson's done both. He did. Uh, and by the way, Shannon Dawson has called plays from upstairs before. You know, I guess he's called plays from downstairs. I don't know. I just like having my coordinator upstairs. I know they do it both ways, by the way. I'm not, you know, I am an idiot, but I'm not, you know, I do realize some coordinators do like it on the field. I just think in his case, based on what he said, his rationale was for being on the field, he should be upstairs. Uh, anyway. be with the What's that? I want to be with the quarterbacks on the field. Yeah, it's yeah. more fun on the field for sure. But notwithstanding that, um, so, so yeah, so it's, so he did not do a running back by committee. I think it was at Southern Miss. I think it, uh, Edo Smith or whoever it was who wound up, I think on the Ravens or something like that. And he, he was a featured back for a couple of years in the Shannon Dawson offense. Uh, and then Shannon Dawson goes to Houston where there really was no really standout running back. And it was a running back by committee. So when a guy's done both, like, that's what I, that's the facts. Like, that's what I believe. I don't care what you tell me after that. So when he tells me, Oh, it's 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 got to be running backs by committee, modern day football, blah 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 blah. When four or five years ago, it wasn't running backs by committee for him. Like I take it with a grain of salt. What I hear him saying to me is, I don't think we have one running back who's ab- above anybody else. Like we got it's got a bunch of guys. We're gonna play him, and we're gonna see who does the best. You know, and I think by the end of the year, I think Miami will have a featured back, and I think it'll be Mark Fletcher. Like that's a, that's my second prediction. Okay, <laughs> I predict that Shannon Dawson. We'll decide he's better off upstairs by the halfway point of the season. I predict Mark Fletcher will be a feature back in an offense that Shannon Dawson insists can't have a feature back because they don't exist anymore. And by the way, the NFL begs to differ, Shannon Dawson. <laughs> All right, other stuff on the website that you don't want to miss. Uh, we have Mario Cristobal talking about fall practice one. Uh, Tyler Van Dyke, same thing. We spoke to Akeem Mesador, who tells us that he is fully healthy now as he heads into training camp. Um Matt Lee, you can never get enough talking to Matt Lee. Uh, uh, wow, what an addition to the program this guy 
is and is going to be. And if you, if, you know, I'm not going to go on and on about why. Just watch, just read the story and watch the video that's with the story, and you will understand why. This guy's a leader. Uh, he's a pure football player. He knows what he is doing out on the football field. He should make the offensive line from a cerebral standpoint considerably better uh this season matt, uh, matt lee not to interrupt you but matt lee is a super super annoying he's super annoying because y- y- you hear alex mirabal talk about him like everybody talks about uh, talks about matt lee like he's he's like he's the next coming of you know i don't know name your favorite player or name the greatest player ever yeah. like, whoever like the guy dude the guy started at ucf he was like a tight end his first year at ucf all of a sudden at Miami, he's the greatest offensive lineman we've ever seen. Like, wait till you guys see the, the Alex Mirabal interview Gary did. I mean, he, he wouldn't talk about it anything except Matt Lee. Gary yep. would say, what did you have for dinner last night? And Alex Mirabal would say, I just want to know what Matt Lee had for dinner last night because whatever he had has to be the best thing ever because, because Matt Lee, he knows everything. He's the smartest person I've ever met. I mean, it's honestly, I don't like people who are, like, put up on a pedestal. I, my job is to tear them down. So Matt Lee, stop annoying me. Stop being so great, and join the rest of us, Matt Shodells, down here uh, at the bottom of the uh, of the dog heap, the dog dog pile. <laughs> All right. Um, we also spoke to Cam Kitchens, who uh, talked to us about how all the guys on defense are holding each other more accountable. This is they, they're making an attempt to transition this into a player led team because. They have been told by the Alonzo Highsmiths of the world, the Ed Reeds of the world, that that's the way it was back in the day, that, that the players ran the program, the players held each other accountable, and that was why Miami was so successful, and they are trying to make that more of a theme this year in the locker room. So uh, check that story out as well. Um, we also have a few recruiting stories today. We decided that we weren't going to make uh, Stephen Wagner wake up at 5 a.m., to tape the show with us and talk about them. Um, but we have more on Nino uh, Francovilla, uh, the, the center prospect who committed to Miami yesterday. We've got, um, we spoke to his coach. So we have a coach's take telling us about uh, Nino. Uh, and we also have an analysis of Nino's game. Uh, so you'll want to be sure to check those out and get to know Miami's latest commit a little bit better. And then we also, by, by, by the way, yesterday, did you find it funny when Stephen used the word Harvard and no brainer in the same sentence? Like, thinking this Harvard guy was a no brainer. Like, I found that funny. You know, no one else seemed to notice in the comments yesterday, but I was waiting to see if somebody picked up on that because these are the little stupid things I find funny. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Not a problem. I, but, but I want to know, like, if, if I interrupt you, I get like annihilated in the YouTube channel. <laughs> I mean, and, and I'm taking it to heart because. I mean, I, we, I in the last day or so, I've had a couple of our female fans come at me pretty hard. And I care a lot about our female fans because there aren't a lot of them. And I want to make sure that they are happy. If they're waking if they're waking up with us in the morning, I want to make sure that they are happy when they're watching the show. And they are, like, very, very uh, firmly telling me, Gary, don't interrupt Matt. We love our Matt Shodell. So I'm trying to be really well behaved today. I think I've accomplished it. I have not interrupted you at all. I now count three times that you've interrupted me. So just be sure of that because the wrath of the female King Sport fans uh, could turn on you as well. I mean, right. look, just so you know, I have signed up for 20 different screen names and 10 of them are female names. And uh, occasionally I do post that uh, you're very rude, a very rude person, and you should stop interrupting Matt. I do post that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Hey, um, and then another thing that's on the website today is uh, a story with uh, linebacker commit Vincent Shavers. Uh, He tells us how there's a Big Ten school, one in particular, that is pushing him really hard for a flip. Uh, Not sure that he will flip. I don't think he will. But uh, it's interesting to hear who's trying to flip these Miami Hurricanes commits. So we have a story on that this morning. Um, Beyond that, we will be back at practice again this morning, and we'll be flooding you with all kinds of coverage as the day goes forward. Uh, We hope you're enjoying it. If you're not a subscriber to canesport.com as of this second, please rush on over to our website. Please take advantage of our 25% off special for an annual subscription, uh, $74.99 for the entire year. Um, comes out to probably like $6 a month, a little more than $6 a month. Uh, I hope that you guys think it's the greatest bargain 
in sports show business. Uh, we try to make it as such, but your subscriptions allow us to do what we do every day for you. Uh, so it's very much appreciated if everybody could subscribe to canesport.com and also hit your subscribe and like buttons here. Uh, it helps us grow our audience on YouTube and helps us with the algorithms uh, that YouTube runs on a daily basis. Um, so I think that's going to do it for Good Morning Cane Sport today. We're going to head out to practice here pretty soon. So for Matt Shodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you once again for starting out your day with us this morning, and we will see you tomorrow, everybody.